The Bible was written long before many modern scientific discoveries were made. Because of this, the authors probably didn't know basic facts about the universe that we know today, and there are strong implications they had a flawed outlook on the cosmos and how biological processes worked. But if this is the case, does that mean the Bible contains errors? Does it mean God allowed scientifically inaccurate ideas into his word? To answer these questions, we need to look at what the aim of the scriptures was within the cultural context. Let's begin with an analogy. Imagine we have invented a highly powerful time-traveling machine that not only allows us to travel through time, but also see alternative timelines. Now imagine we realize that if we go back to the past and prevent the Hyksos of Egypt from losing to the 17th dynasty of Egypt, a series of chain reactions will be set off, making the world a much better place today. So we travel back to the past and go to the Hyksos Pharaoh and say, Your Majesty, as the sun rises tomorrow, your kingdom will fall if you do not do as we say. If you love your people with all your heart, you must trust your gut feeling that we are telling you the truth. Now look at this statement and ask yourself, did I lie to the Pharaoh? It may seem like an odd question, but I told him the sun will rise, when in fact the sun doesn't move. Thanks to modern scientific discoveries, we know the earth moves around the sun to only give the appearance the sun is rising in the sky. I also said he needs to trust his gut feeling and that he should love his people with all of his heart. But emotions are not in your stomach or heart. On top of that, people in the ancient world actually did think emotions and feelings were in your guts. They also thought the sun moved around the earth and traveled through the underworld at night. So many of the things I said would have been taken literally by the Pharaoh. So again, in this analogy, did I lie? The most obvious answer is no. I did not lie because I didn't travel to the past to teach him scientific facts. I traveled to the past to get him to trust me so I could teach him battle tactics, and I used familiar language to communicate. Even though I would have understood these phrases as metaphorical, whereas he might have understood them as literal. But just because I didn't explain beforehand these phrases were metaphorical, that doesn't mean I lied or uttered scientific inaccuracies. I use these phrases on purpose because we still use them today, even though we don't think them as describing literal truths. Every day we use phrases like sunrise or sunset, but we understand this is not literally what is taking place in the solar system. So the first important point to remember is messages don't necessarily carry inaccuracies based on the aim of the message. John Walton brings this issue up in his book, The Lost World of Scripture, and says we need to understand biblical statements in terms of basic components of speech act theory. Speech act theory is a philosophical field of study that focuses on how words can be used to present information, but also carry out actions. It has three basic components, locution, illocution, and perlocution. Locution is the actual utterance or sounds of the words that are said. Illocution is the intended or implied result of the statement, and perlocution is the actual effect of the locutionary and illocutionary acts. Okay, so this is quite complex, but it can be better explained through examples. If I were to ask a store employee, do you have a restroom in the building? The locution, or what I uttered, is asking if they have a restroom. But I'm not asking to find out the architectural design of the building. The illocution, or intended meaning of what I'm asking, is I need to use the restroom, and if they can point me in the direction of where it is. See, the words used for the question, the locution, is different than the intended meaning, the illocution, and what I want is a response of getting them to realize I need to use the restroom, perlocution. Let's say an employer tells an employee, clean out your desk. The locution is different than the intended meaning. The employer is not saying go tidy up your desk, but they want to give the illocution that they are fired and they need to leave, and hoping the effect is a perlocutionary act of realizing 
they no longer work for the company. What if I ask my wife, are you angry at me? And she replies, I'm fine, just fine, I'm not angry. Only an idiot would take this phrase at its face value. The locution is the exact opposite of the illocution, the intended meaning. She really is angry and is trying to enlighten me, per locution, to this by how she words her locutionary and illocutionary acts. Now let's go back to the original time traveling example. The locution of my original statement was the sun moves around the earth, there is a literal substance in your heart called love, and feelings exist in the stomach. But that is not the illocution or intended meaning, or the perlocution of what I want the pharaoh to have. What my statement is supposed to do is to persuade him to trust me. So this is why I didn't lie to the pharaoh. My intended meaning is what is important, not the words used to give that meaning. In a nutshell, locution is the words or sounds of a statement. Illocution is the intended meaning of the statement, and the perlocution is the effect you want to happen from your statement. Whether that is realization, persuasion, convicting, scaring, inspiring, etc. This is why speech act theory is quite interesting, because think of the things you say on a daily basis that were never intended to be literal. A lot of the things we utter in our daily lives is not intended to be understood as it is actually uttered. So why would we expect if God is communicating a message to humans similar to us, he would use absolute literal language and not try to communicate in a way that relates to how they speak with each other? Wouldn't God use the terms and language familiar to them to meet them where they are? Because of this, it is fallacious to say the Bible is an error when it uses the locution of the ancient authors, because that is not the illocution God is intending. For example, there is no doubt among scholars the ancient biblical authors believe things about the world that are factually incorrect. Proverbs 23.16 literally says in the Hebrew, My kidneys will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. It is probably true the ancient authors thought emotions and cognitive faculties operated in the gut. But this chapter is not giving an anatomy lesson. The intended meaning is encouraging proper moral behavior. So we don't have to adopt the cultural belief cognition operated in the guts, as that is not the intended meaning. Psalm 29 says the Lord reigns above the flood. According to ancient Near Eastern cosmology, the earth was a flat disk on pillars that was covered by a solid dome and surrounded by floodwaters. God's abode was above that. But again, the illocution of this psalm is that God reigns over the whole world. It is not a lesson in the earth's geology. The perlocution or intended effect we are supposed to have is that there is no one above God. Genesis 8 recounts the end of the flood and verse 2 says, The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. Ancient people probably did think the dome over the earth had windows that let the flood waters in. But the illocution or intended meaning of this verse is that the rain stopped. So even if the ancient author understood this as literal windows, that doesn't mean that is God's intended message for us to get. A lot of people take aim at the rakia or firmament in Genesis 1, which was understood as a solid dome over the earth, separating the waters above. Some scholars have suggested it could mean an expanse in the heavens, which is possible, but even if they are wrong, this hardly threatens the text. As we've argued extensively in our Genesis series, the aim of Genesis 1 is God is inaugurating the cosmos as his temple and giving proper functions to its aspects. D.G.A. Kleins and J. Richard Middleton note the existence of the firmament is in relation to its purpose, as that is the overall aim of Genesis 1. The prior paragraph of God creating light even has parallels to Jeremiah 4, where a lack of light is used metaphorically to refer to a kingdom that no longer functions properly. So the illocution of this passage is not to understand the physical structure of the cosmos, but to understand God has dominion over the whole earth, including the sky above. This is only explained in terms of the locution of the ancient audience, because that is who the passage was written to. 
I bring up all these examples to note the obvious. The Bible is not a scientific textbook and was never intended to be. The aim or intended meaning of the authors was to state theological truths, and they could only do this with their own terminology or locution. But because their aim was never to teach scientific facts, it is not fair to say they lied or stated something false. Just like when you say the sun will rise tomorrow, it would be uncharitable and ridiculous for someone to call you a flat earther. And likewise, it is just as ridiculous to assume this means God was advocating scientific inaccuracies because he was working through ancient authors. Our aim should be the illocution or intended meaning, not nitpick at the terminology used to give that meaning. To quote John Walton, even though people in Israel believe there were waters above the earth held back by a solid sky, or that cognitive processes took place in the heart or kidneys, the illocution of the text is not affirming those beliefs as revealed truth. Culture-specific aspects of an illocution do not have a universal perlocution, eating pork, circumcision, head covering. Culture-specific aspects of the perlocution need to be translated to an appropriate contemporary perlocution. So for example, it is no surprise that ancient Israel believed in a solid sky, and God accommodated his locution to that model in his communication to them. But since the illocution is not to assert the true shape of cosmic geography, we can safely set those details aside as incidental without jeopardizing authority or inerrancy. God implies in scripture he meets people where they are and tries to bring them to a better place instead of expecting people to be perfect the moment he meets them. In Matthew 19, Jesus states the law of divorce in the Mosaic law was given because their hearts were hard. The strong implication is the Mosaic law was not ideal or the final law for humanity, but a compromise. Because humanity, at that time, was not ready for marriage laws that God really desires. Anyone who raises a toddler can relate. Your ideal setting may be that your kids go to bed on time and always eat their dinner, but you understand mentally they are just not ready for those standards. So compromises are formed to try to work with your kids to help them mature. Likewise, if God understands the ancient Israelites were not ready for a perfect law and gave them the Mosaic law as a compromise, we should also be able to understand God can work through the language and cosmological views of early humans without having to give them 21st century brains. God doesn't say to himself first, boy, you know, you know, I'd, I'd really like to tell them about how I made everything. But how do I do that? I mean, I, I've, got to, I've got to change the way they think. I've got to give them more information so that when I really give them the scientific details, they'll understand it. And not only that, but I have another problem. You know, God says to himself in this imaginary conversation, even if I take the writer and make him super normal, super human, that I advance his brain, when I fill his brain with all this post-Darwinistic, because I know this guy Darwin's coming along. If I fill his brain with that and enable him to write in such a way that it will encompass and critique Darwin before Darwin's ever born, how is what he's writing going to be at all coherent to the people who read it, the people that I haven't advanced their brain? Now at this point, some skeptics might object that it wouldn't have been hard for God to tell people scientific truths through revelation. But I think the main problem is skeptics assume such a message would have gotten through or translated properly. Remember that Jesus said God couldn't even teach them proper ethics because their hearts were hard, and the Pentateuch describes the Israelites as stiff-necked. I don't know if you've ever tried to describe a scientific theory to someone who didn't care but their eyes gloss over real quickly. God had a hard enough time trying to get Israel to trust him even after he delivered them from Egypt. He presented a collection of laws that was supposed to be a compromise and they couldn't even properly keep that. The obvious point to bring home is humanity was not ready for this level of knowledge and probably was not even open to it. Ancient people didn't necessarily care about the same things you care about. 
the ancient Israelites' focus was on staying alive from constant threats, such as war and famine. If God informed them of modern scientific facts, it is hard to imagine anyone would have cared in that state of an environment, or would have found it relatable. They preserved what was important to them, not what was important to 21st century Westerners. Also, scientific advances have inadvertently led to technological advances that have been used for evil purposes. I don't think we're really thinking this one through. If humanity was not ready for a perfect moral law from God, I think he did the right thing in not trusting them with advanced scientific knowledge. The last thing we would have wanted to see would have been atomic theory or combustion engines in the hands of Nero or Vlad the Impaler. So the truth is humanity was simply not ready for this level of knowledge, and God worked through humanity where they were intellectually and ethically to bring them to a better place so we could make these necessary scientific advances. Thus, for modern readers, we need not worry about reading biblical texts and looking for scientific truths. We ought to read the texts with their mindset in view and focus on the intended meaning or illocution, and we need not worry if their locution affects the accuracy of scripture. Their aim was never to teach cosmology or biology, but to teach theology and the theological implications of historical events. By what terminology they used is beside the point, as that is confusing locution for illocution.